July 1st is a pretty big date coming up. A lot of things happening on that one day. And then also Vermont. Are we bummed about that? Are we not bummed about it? You know, where we get get your perspective. Sure. Um, well, you know, I feel like we're in different mile markers in our very long sprint marathon, sprint marathon kind of continue <laughs> go, but no stopping point really in the vicinity. Uh, so July 1st is a big date, um, big day for a few reasons. So we've got Florida that becomes effective. And I know some companies think, oh, I'm not within Florida's scope, but Florida has a consent requirement for sensitive personal information that is pretty broad. And there could also be trickle down effects by the, the platforms that are subject to it and how those restrictions then play out in, ter in terms of users of those platforms. So I think that that's a notable one. Um, we've got Texas becomes effective. And then we have Vermont, I'm sorry, not Vermont, we're gonna get to Vermont, Oregon, um, I was thinking green. Oregon uh, becomes effective. And Oregon has a unique requirement where in, you both have to notify about the right by consumers to ask about the third parties um, that you were selling, the, the specific third parties that you were selling personal information to either about that person or just more broadly, but that list of specific third parties. And that's not one we've seen before. And so that becomes effective July 1st. And be interesting to see. A, how many consumers make that request, and then how companies are interpreting that and the kinds of lists that they're providing. There's a trade secret exemption, but you'd have to actually support trade secret exemption for, for those entities that you might not list. So I think that that is an interesting thing to be mindful about. And then on the deadlines, California, of course, the law is already effective, but if you are a large company, essentially, that with over 10 million California residents' data, you have to post your updated DSAR metrics, your, your privacy rights metrics in terms of how you handle them um, for the prior calendar year. So that's always interesting. You know, if we have these benchmarks comparing year to year, um, mm -hmm. what do those numbers look like for the large enterprise clients? I think a lot of folks are, are certainly going to be monitoring for that. Yeah, that's interesting. How the, on the Oregon thing, um, so it's not a dis you don't have to disclose it. You, you only... You only disclose the parties you're working with or sending data to if somebody asks. Did I get that right? You you have to disclose that there is a right, right? So that's in your privacy policy for Oregon residents. And then when, it, when an Oregon resident makes the request, then you have to disclose it in response to that particular request. Um, you know, I, I we've already seen media uh, members make requests in the past from different, um, uh, under different state privacy rights. So I... I anticipate we might see some of that and then maybe some media coverage. So we shall see. How deep do you go? Like, is it the first line of vendors or what about when they've shared data on, you know, like on a web typical website, right? It's there's ushers and there's collectors. Exactly. That is the key question of like, how do you interpret that? How many degrees? It doesn't involve processors. So not your service providers. It's really those third parties that you're selling data to and selling using that very broad interpretation. Um, so we'll, we'll see. I mean, I think a lot, how many degrees downstream? Yes, that's a big question. I think there'll certainly be some comparisons among how different companies are, are treating that. Well, I don't like Oregon. You know, the California thing, one of the things I mean, that I've been trying to nail that I haven't been able to find is how many people are opting out? Like what percentage of the population is opting out? And is, is that even a good, good measure of that? Why, why, so these, these disclosures are just in your own privacy policy for that company, right? There's no central database. There's On the metrics, there's no, that I'm aware of, there's no one central source. Somebody would have to do that, right? They'd have to look who are the companies that are most likely to be hitting that threshold of the 10 million and then canvassing and taking those metrics and posting them in, in one unified place. So I haven't seen that. It doesn't mean that it's not going to happen. I can anticipate that we might see at least some coverage of that front. So it'll be interesting. I agree with you. There is such an interest from the business community in what is the opt-out rate? Um, how big is it? Early on, IAB had done a survey and it was less than 5% at that time, but there's more awareness. So I think one, has that, has that percentage gone up? Um, two, how are companies accounting for global privacy control within their opt-out metrics? And is that reflected? So I think it'll be interesting, even if it's not a perfect number, like has it gone up just, you know, as a bottom line. 
Yeah, but that five percent was before we even started. Right. Yeah, yeah, you don't know. If you took a guess, would you say 15, 20? No. No. I, I think it's still under 10%. Okay. Good to know. Good to know. Yeah, and then to your point, you're measuring the unmeasurable. If people have opted out already coming in, you're not gonna know. Or you could take the GPC signals, maybe you could see those. Well, I mean, that's the thing. If you're if you're GPC and you're anonymous, we just have to recognize that signal. But the question is, how do you associate and persist it for a particular person so that it's considered a unique opt out as opposed to somebody's coming on different browsers, different devices? You don't know that it's that same person if you're just recognizing it as anonymous. And that's it's a question, right? Mm -hmm. Do you um, identify who the person is to persist that throughout the environment? It, it's not seeing too many companies doing that. But sure. you think the regulators would care about this number <clears throat> as an indicator, maybe, of how well things are going to be? Well, who's to say they don't, right? Like, mm -hmm. I, I think you know, we were early on in the past past years, but it'll be interesting to see what the coverage is of, of the metrics that they see. Right, sure. Thanks, Lisa. Well, July 1st looks pretty interesting. I don't know how <clears throat> that crept up on us like that, crept up on me. I'm sure you're all over it. So for mine, uh, actually, it was kind of fun watching that play out over the last, I guess, couple of months. And <clears throat> I thought the private right action, like it, like everybody knew that, hey, look, this is maybe some kind of poison pill. It wasn't going to happen with that. But then, you know, when they reached that compromise and it was, it had a three-month cure, it had a, a threshold of 100,000 Vermonters. I thought that was like a pretty cool compromise. And then even though it passed the House, there was a veto, obviously, and then couldn't override the veto. What do you think of that? I mean, do you think... There was an IAPP piece that said this is a step back for privacy. I know there's opposition to private rights of action too, good reasons not to have it. Like, what do you, what do you think about the whole thing? So, I, I mean, I come at it from a very realist, realist perspective in that we're still in such a crawl walk phase where companies are just building the infrastructure. And as each state has something slightly different on how to interpret their law, that takes time and it takes resources. And so I think companies are are moving. Um, nobody that I work with is, is just saying, I'm not going to address these new legal requirements. But unlike, I think, data security, which can be very specific, and we've got certain standards that you have to meet, there's so much with privacy that is good judgment um, and, and calibrating and really weighing and... I think if you throw a private right of action in the mix early on, there's just a lot of diverting resources to then defend suits. And I get that there's, you know, the, the business threshold in terms of small businesses, but what we see from other kinds of consumer privacy rights of action is doesn't mean that the plaintiffs bar don't file those suits. And you might have the defense that, no, no, I'm not a business of the size that triggers this, but you're still paying legal fees to defend. You get those demand letters and they're asking for money to settle and you're getting, so you're still spending money to defend that. And I would just say in this crawl walk phase, and I have a bias, but in this crawl walk phase, I would rather those companies put the resources into building their programs and that maybe start with here are the requirements. And then, you know, you can always amend legislation a year or two years later, take a, a sense of where companies are. So it's not, you're not st stopped from, from doing that. That is that is my perspective. Yeah, that's cool. It's not it's not on off switch or yes, no, I'm wrong. Actually, it's a timing thing. We're super early in the maturity of privacy law rollouts. And, ha and having, having that additional burden, I guess, of the plaintiff's bar and all that stuff while you're trying to figure stuff out. Just, I get it. It just feels like a little too much. I mean, they had the, there was a two, two year kind of trial period for it, but still you'd rather start in two years than start now while we're figuring it out. Right. Because it's still budget planning. I mean, you think about so much for privacy is data governance and that infrastructure is not something you do in a quarter. Right. That is budget planning. That is a whole host of different vendors. It, it, it just realistically takes a lot of time to get that right. And so there is, yes, we would love to snap our fingers and have companies like have the most beautiful, thoughtful privacy programs. And I, I definitely appreciate the argument that, well, enforcement uh, is the only way to really light the fire and make companies move faster. And, and there may be some truth to that. However, like that money has to come from somewhere. 
And I, I just know how much of the resources that I'm seeing and people power and, uh, you know, just technical power being put into trying to stand this up in the first instance. Um, I worry that if that money is going instead to to pay off um, attorneys. Yeah, gotcha. And when you think about the the advertising ecosystem, and the whole ad tech environment, that's a super tanker that needs to turn around on this stuff that isn't going to happen. Like, there's so many issues around again, your resolution and, and flowing consent downstream, but just, I don't know if the industry is there ready to do They're not, right? I mean, we're having technical yeah. specifications that have, it took time to develop them. Now they have to be adopted. It takes time to both adopt and implement them. Um, it Again, you can't snap your fingers. Like it yeah. is moving. Everybody wants it to move faster. I get that. Yeah. Well, thanks, Lisa. I always appreciate the kind of practical perspective Keeping it well for us. So, what about the other pieces of it? I mean, data minimization, the whole like you know, no notice and choice start to feel like dirty words. Like, oh, that's kind of that's some twenty seventeen stuff. <laughs> so, the data minimization pieces I thought in, in the Vermont law were cool. Do you think the world's moving that way? Yes, uh, yeah. hands down. Yes, because before it was like you put it in your privacy policy and you're good. Um, and maybe if it was sensitive information, you get consent. I think that that was an old way of looking at it. And now you really have to justify. Um, you have to justify that it is proportionate. It is compatible with what a consumer's expectations is, meaning you have to know why you're collecting the data and account for it. And so that's much more of a risk assessment. Like that is, there's calibration involved as opposed to like the all-you-can-eat buffet of, of data. So I think that is a trend line that is moving one direction. Does that work in the... In the context of AI or AI coming and kind of, I just, I mean, just, just this morning I was on the iPad and Apple said, Hey, your health data is going to be synced now across your devices. And I'm like, okay, so they got the health data. They've got the wallet. I don't know if there's specific purposes aligned to that. And it doesn't feel like it's a data minimization thing. It feels like it's, uh, let's collect all the data and kind of figure out later what to do with all this. So like, in the world of AI, it feels like, hey, you collect all the data, apply it, apply it to whatever you're trying to do in the model. I don't see how data minimization fits there, or am I thinking about it wrong? Well, I think there are a few different questions. One, we're early on AI, and so those are two different moving trains, and which one's moving faster versus mm -hmm. you know, uh, against privacy? I, I don't know the answer to that, but I think it goes to what is the level of transparency and permissions around using data for AI do you need the personal information itself to power the AI or is there a process in between powering AI? And maybe you do, right? But then what is the use case and what is the risk assessment on the use case? And then how do you anticipate and account for the foreseeable harms that could happen from using that AI? And I think we should also be just pretty thoughtful that we've already heard from regulators like the, the California Privacy Protection Agency on, well, what happens now, if, if somebody makes a privacy a deletion request and you use that, it, like you still have obligations, at least the thought might be that you have obligations when they opt out of that. So there's no free ticket. But yeah. Well, thanks, Alisa. I, I appreciate it. We don't have any editors on this anymore, so we can go as long as we want, but it's just kidding. <laughs> appreciate the time as always. Good to see you. Good to see you.